Hey everyone, welcome back to the podcast. I'm Brian, this is Our Weird World. So before we get into the episode today, I want to give a big thanks to everybody that's on the Facebook page. I've been seeing that it's been slowly growing and people have been joining, so thank you, I appreciate it, that's awesome. Um, Feel free to get on there, check it out. Facebook.com, Our Weird World. Um, I'd love to have you there. Yeah, please, you know, write me a comment, question, whatever you want on there. It, it's That's what it's for. It's for all of you listeners to get on there and, and, and interact, ask questions, what, whatever you want. Uh, please feel free. But anyways, yeah, I'm glad to see that people have been joining it, so that's awesome. Also, I've been looking at my analytics for all of the listeners and everybody listening to the podcast, and that too has been growing very steadily as well. Um, listeners all over the world, which is fantastic. I think that's great. I'm glad to see it. So to all of you people that are out there listening, thank you. I appreciate it. And that's why I'm doing this. Um, I, I do it for all of you for, you know, maybe you can learn something new, maybe hear about something you didn't know before. And even me, when I do these podcasts, when I when I do these episodes, it's, it's also a learning experience for me. It, it might be something that I've never heard of before or or history that I didn't know, you know, and so I'm able to learn something too. So, and that's why, again, why I started this podcast, I want to be able to share this with all of you out there. You know, some of, some things, some of these episodes I've done are things that I have known from documentaries I've watched or other podcasts that I listen to. And I just want to share it to the world in my own voice. So I'm glad that you're all out there listening. I'm, I'm glad that you're enjoying it. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions for any other topics or episodes, please let me know. You can email me at ourweirdworldpodcast at gmail.com. That's going to be the best place to get in touch with me. Or again, on Facebook. Check me out there too. Again, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. That's why I do it for, is for all of you, the listeners. So thank you. Today's episode, what are we talking about? So I want to get back into my 50 states, um, infamous serial killers uh, series, if you will. I started doing that end of last year. I got a couple in um, with, uh, what did I do? Uh, Arizona with Mark Goudeau and then uh, Massachusetts with the Boston Strangler. So today, if, if you remember listening to those episodes, I mentioned how I came up with my, the episodes as I've moved along. I, I, I'm a big time computer nerd. I'm, I'm an electronics technician by trade. If you And uh, so I wrote a code using uh, Python, which is a a code creator. And I basically just created a random number generator, plugged in 1 through 50, and it spit out these the random sequence. So that's how I came up with this. Anyways, so today, the next number on that sequence is the number 4, which, and I created an alphabetical list of all the 50 states. So that gives us Arkansas. So I thought, okay, Arkansas, what, what do we have in Arkansas? There's some really good ones in the state of Arkansas, as I did my research. Um, there's a couple that come to mind, but the one that I really thought would be cool to talk about, which I do believe is a pretty infamous one, um, the most infamous, possibly, like I said, there's some others that are, are pretty good in Arkansas as well, um, that I might do other episodes in the future just to do episodes on because they're some pretty heinous ones too. But anyways... The one that I thought that I would talk about is known as the Arkansas or the Texarkana Phantom Killer. And the reason it's it's sometimes referred to as both is uh, it's often referred to as Texarkana Phantom Killer or even Texarkana Moonlight Murderer or Murders because it actually took place in Texarkana, which is a town on the border of Arkansas and Texas. Uh, which sits in Miller County, Arkansas, and Bowie County, Texas, right on the border. So you get this town called Texarkana. So for those of you that are outside of the United States or or not even familiar with that area, you have obviously you have Texas and the state of Arkansas bordering each other, and there's a town right on the border, duly named Texarkana. We even have here in New Mexico, the state that I live in, we have a, a town right on the border with Texas called Texaco. Texas, Mexico, New Mexico, right? So Texaco. So you get these border towns that have these split names where they take the two states and put them together. So Texaco over on 
the west end of Texas, Texarkana on the east side, bordering Arkansas. So, thought that's that's kind of interesting. So, anyways, you might hear it referred to as the Arkansas Phantom Killer or the Texarkana Phantom Killer, or the Moonlight Murders, or or any of those kind of different names kind of jumbled together. I've seen it written all manner of different ways, but Phantom Killer or Moonlight Murders, those are the two common what you'll hear it referred to as. So this is actually a serial killer or serial killings that are still unsolved. It is considered a cold case now, but let me check my notes here on my research. Let me double check here. Da, 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 da. Yeah, so it is, it is considered a cold case, but technically it is still an open case as well because it was never solved. There was never anybody convicted as to the murders. You know, leave that in your back pocket as I go through it and talk about things. All right, the Moonlight Murders or the Phantom Killer of Texarkana. What, what exactly were these? What happened? Who did it, supposedly? And when did it happen? These occurred throughout the spring of 1946. There were five individuals that were murdered, and there were three others that were wounded that did, that did survive. Now, like I said, there was a suspect, but again, was never convicted of these crimes. One note, these murders were the partial um, inspiration, I guess you could say, for a movie called The Town That Dreaded Sundown. Now, this is a movie that came out in 1976, so it was 30 years after the murders. I'm going to talk about the movie here just briefly. I haven't seen it personally. I, I kind of want to see if I can try to find it somewhere, maybe rent it. Or, I, I don't like going to blockbusters that really doesn't exist anymore. Now, there, there's one still in the country, but it's a little too far for me. Um, or maybe trying to see if I can find it somewhere, streaming, download it, maybe see if I can find it on DVD or Blu-ray. But anyways, I think it'd be kind of cool to watch and see how it compares to this. So like I said, it's kind of loosely based on these murders. They took inspiration from it. So the story of the movie, again, 1946, where when the murders occurred, this movie came out in 1976, so 30 years after the murders. It takes place around Texarkana, and right after World War II. So, just like we're setting up for these the actual murders. Now, it is actually considered one of the first movies to be kind of dubbed in the sort of uh, slasher horror genre of movies. Um, you know, the, these films started in the early 70s and became very popular in that, that time frame, but this is kind of one of the early slasher genre horror films. It is ten, tends to be considered a cult classic, um, and was pretty profitable and did pretty well. Um, it was actually remade in 2014, and that version I didn't know about. I, I wasn't aware of that version, so maybe I'll try to find both of them. Who knows? We'll see. Um, so yeah, if, if you've seen this movie, let me know. Let me know what you think of it. Um, is, is it worth my time watching? I, I hope so. Like I said, I'll, I'll try to find it, see if I can watch it. But So the film, it was shot in June and July of 1976. It was actually shot around Texarkana. Um, there were actually a lot of local residents that were cast as extras and actors. Um, there were other various Arkansas locations that they filmed. Uh, they also filmed some of it in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. I don't want to. I guess I don't want to get into the movie too much because it does mirror. Uh, as I look at my notes, it does mirror the actual events of the murder quite a bit. So let's talk about the murders. Maybe we'll kind of go back and forth, talk about the movie a little bit, how they compare as well. So yeah, going back to the actual murders, the first one occurred on February 22nd, 1946. There were two people, two young individuals, uh, a boy named Jimmy Hollis and a young lady named Mary Jean Larry. They were parked in their car in on a secluded road in Bowie County. Excuse me, Bowie County Road, excuse me. That's just outside of Texarkana kind of a lover's lane, if you will. So you can imagine an evening, you know, two young folks in a car. You know, you can let your imagination run wild. They were there parked, doing whatever they're doing, when a man showed up at their car 
and forced them out of the vehicle. And he was armed, and his face was hidden with a burlap sack. So he was wearing a burlap sack over his face, and he had holes cut out for his eyes so that he could see. So this assailant pulled Jimmy Hollis from the car, beat him with his gun. Uh, it actually cracked his skull twice in, uh, in two separate places, locations on his skull. Uh, this assailant, he then sexually assaulted Mary Jean before fleeing. And the reason he fled the area was that there were headlights from another car approaching and it scared the person off and, and they ran off. Both Jimmy and Mary Jean did survive this incident. Uh, they were able to recover from their wounds and give reports of what happened. And this would later help uh, with, with later events in, in, in all of this. And we'll come back to later. But those are the first two victims. Again, they did survive. Over a month later, March 24th, there were two young individuals, again, two young people, Richard Griffin and Polly Ann Moore. Unfortunately, they were the first two murder victims. Their bodies were found on another back road in the same uh, Bowie County. I, I said Bowie County Road in the other it, in Bowie County. It doesn't it the research it doesn't give a specific actual name, just a back road in Bowie County, kind of another lover's lane, if you will. So, anyways, it was another back country road in Bowie County, again a sort of lover's lane, if you will. Now, the two individuals they were both found shot in the back of their head with a 32 round, most likely from a revolver. There were actually blood stains discovered on the ground outside their vehicle, which indicated to investigators that they were killed outside of the car, but their bodies were actually found inside the car. So the investigators believe that they were forced out, uh, kind of like uh, Jimmy and Mary Jean, uh, Richard and Polly Ann were forced out, murdered, shot, and then the assailant put their bodies back into the car based on the evidence that they were able to find. Now, again, almost a month later, three weeks later, on April 14th, another pair of young individu individuals, teenagers, Paul Martin and Betty Jo Booker, they were found dead in Spring Lake Park. Now, this is on the Texas side of Texarkana. Their bodies were actually found quite a dis distance away from their car. So, not placed back into their car. But once again, they were shot with a 32 caliber pistol round was the murder weapon. So again, police believe that it was the same assailant. Now, being that their bodies were not placed back into the car, it did bring up some questions that was it the same person or not? Or perhaps the assailant shot them and killed them. And then again, kind of like the first incident where the two weren't killed, maybe they, the assailant got scared off by somebody approaching the area, something like that. So. Again, they were murdered, their bodies were away from their car, not placed back into the vehicle. The young ladies in both of these murders, unfortunately, had been tortured and sexually assaulted before being killed. That, obviously, right now, before we get into more of the evidence, leads you to believe that this person was likely there to sexually assault, rape these young ladies, and then murder them. Or was it somebody that was following them and wanted to sexually assault these women, but then they had a male companion with them? Perhaps the male companion was just in the way or tried to defend for the women. You know, different things like that kind of come to mind. But anyways, the women were sexually assaulted and killed, unfortunately. Now, after these occurred, police in the area did increase their patrols and particularly on more rural and secluded roads and roads that they coined as sort of lover's lanes. That's why I, I kept mentioning it earlier. So they would go to these kind of known lover's lanes and would act as security, right? You know, you're out there out there patrolling and, and seeing if anything is going on. It's unfortunate that these people had to go through this. On the next month, on May 3rd, so another few weeks later, there was an isolated farmhouse in Miller County. Arkansas. Now, let me make sure I got that right and double check my, yep, Miller County is on the Arkansas side. And this was the scene of another murder. Now, this is where uh, 
man and woman Virgil Starks and Katie Starks lived. They were farmers. Virgil was actually shot twice and killed by an attacker on, uh, excuse me, standing outside of his front window. So he was just inside his house and was shot and killed from his front window. Now, his wife, Katie Starks, she heard the shots. She ran to her phone to call the police. She was actually shot twice in the face as well. Was not killed. She survived. Despite this, despite having been shot twice in the face, she was actually able to escape and ran to a nearby farmhouse, uh, you know, probably another na- neighbor down, down the way, and to, to get help. These two were not shot with a 32 caliber pistol. They were actually shot with a 22 caliber pistol. But there were tire tracks that were found in the area of this farmhouse that police did say were similar to those in the earlier cases that they found around the area of the other murders. Now, of course, yeah, that, that's that's pretty decent evidence, I guess. But tires, you know, it's even back then, you could have had the same tires on a different vehicle. It could have been somebody else, a different assailant. But still, it did leave the investigators believe that it was the same killer. Um, they attributed it being the same killer, one, because it's in the same area, similar tires. Yes, it's a smaller caliber bullet the 22 versus the 32 but because it's you've got this time gap again you've got these three weeks between the last one which was in april 14th this one was on may 3rd the killer could possess multiple guns and that's kind of the thought process the investigators had at the time was okay the, the first ones we found were done with the 32 caliber this was done with the 22 caliber who's to say the killer doesn't have multiple weapons or went and got a different one maybe something came about and they had to go get a different gun or decided to get a different gun to maybe make it look like it wasn't them. So anyways, at this point, law enforcement investigators do believe it's the same person. So they're they're looking for the same person at this point. So now, in total, we have two women and three men that have been murdered. So that's your five victims. With each of these murders, obviously panic began to rise throughout the whole area of Texarkana. You know, people start hearing about this. You know, it's the, the mid '40s. It's right after the World War II occurred. You know, people are coming back to the states. They want to live their lives peacefully. They they want to be farmers, whatever. You know, and try to raise their families. And now here they are, citizens in this town. They're scared because there's somebody on the loose murdering people, especially the young people. And obviously, you had these the, the the farmers, Virgil and Katie Starks. But still, the investigators still believe it's the same. Anyways, so the citizens are getting restless and scared so the purchasing of firearms increased dramatically in the town at the time Uh, people began to stay in their homes uh, at night uh, especially at sundown because these murders were occurring right near sunset right at right at sundown Um, that's why we kind of get the name uh, of the the moonlight murders citizens are are they're scared they're buying guns they're staying at home at night Again, especially at sundown, sunset. So law enforcement officials from both Arkansas and Texas, they started working on this case together. They came together and said, okay, we need to figure this out because it's happening in this town on both in both Texas and Arkansas. So they got together. Now the Texas Rangers, they actually got involved as well. There was a young, he's he's been quoted as being a charismatic uh, Texas Ranger named Manuel Gonzalez. I believe it's pronounced Gonzalez. It's a spelling I've never seen before, G-O-N-Z-A-U-L-L-A-S. If it's pronounced a different way, let me know. I'm not sure. I'm going to say Gonzalez. Um, He was known as, quote, Lone Wolf. That was his uh, uh, nickname that was given to him. So Manuel Manuel Lone Wolf Gonzalez, and he was a Texas Ranger. So he came to the town to help investigate. Of course, news of this spread all over the place. So the media, reporters, they flock to the town trying to get any information and interview locals and law enforcement and whatnot. So this just added to kind of the overall chaos in the town at the time. Now, shortly after this, Um, 
some neighbors actually reported seeing strange lights coming from the Starks farmhouse. And I guess a lot of people reported this to the local police and it, it kind of eyebrows raised and it, it kind of brought a lot of questions to light. Oh my gosh, there's strange light at this, this Starks farmhouse. What's going on? Well, calm down. It, it was nothing. It was actually, turns out that it was the Texas Ranger Lone Wolf and a woman reporter from Life magazine. They actually went to the crime scene of this house and were taking photos and the flashbulbs were what people were seeing. But the local police actually came to the scene when all these reports came out and surrounded the house. And then they realized, oh, it's just our Texas Ranger that's helping Mr. Lone Wolf over here. Again, living up to his name, Lone Wolf, he's out here by himself. Well, sort of by He's with the reporter that, from, like I said, from Life magazine. And they're taking pictures of, of the scene. Shortly after this is when the murders were actually dubbed the Moonlight Murders. Now, this, this actually came from the the media that was there reporting on it. They they came up with this name, the Moonlight Murders. I wasn't able to find exactly who coined the term, term excuse me, um, which reporter or a, a news agency actually came up with the term Moonlight Murders, but it was from them that, that coined this term. You know, in all these serial killings, any of them that you you hear this a lot where it's you know they coin these fantastical kind of names right and it, it makes sense they're going based on certain patterns you know obviously this one moonlight murders they're going because it's they're happening in the evening as the sun is setting it's becoming night they come up with some sort of name that sounds you know very alluring and, and romantic if you will right but it, I, I get it. It makes sense. It's an easy name to put on something or, or term to be able to refer to it. And, and then that way everybody understands and knows, right? They, they, you say Moonlight Murders and everybody, okay, we know immediately what you're talking about, which is fine. And again, because they don't have a suspect, it's easier to put uh, uh, some sort of like a fictional name like that on it. You know, they, they all have them. They all have their sort of unique name like that, right? You know, like like the last one I did, the Boston Strangler. Anyways, they all have these names like this. So anyways, it was called the Moonlight Murders. That's what they were calling it now at this time. But even despite that, the first two occurred a week after the full moon. And the final attack occurred around the time of the new moon. Just, just to let you know that. But still, got that name, Moonlight Murders. Again... Because these murders were happening in a way that um, the killer would strike and then would vanish, right? Right away. This murderer was also dubbed the Phantom Killer. So you had the Moonlight Murders was kind of the general name for all of it, I guess. And then the Phantom Killer was kind of the name that was put onto the, the perp, the, the person that was doing this, or the, the murderer that was out there. So you had the Moonlight Murders perpetrated by the phantom killer um this one w was actually came from a local newspaper called the texarkana gazette that they were the ones that coined the term phantom killer for the individual wh whoever it was that was doing this so you know they're they're out there okay law enforcement are looking for this individual we're going to call him the phantom killer so they put a name to whoever it, it is that was doing this a lot of individuals actually came out and claimed to be the phantom killer while other citizens came forward with various ac accusations against other local residents um you know I, I think some of this could just be the hysteria at the time some people wanting to seek the fame of it why i don't know you know as the phantom killer I, you know i don't know what's going through people's minds back then um but then the, the the other side of that where where people are accusing others, yeah, I think that again is just adding to the hysteria. People are scared. They 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 want to point fingers, right? You want to find somebody and you want to put them behind bars. You want to see them hang, et cetera, right? So I again I think it was just at the time people were scared. They want it to be over. They want the law enforcement to find somebody. So they're gonna point fingers. Oh, it's this guy. He doesn't look right. Oh, what's this lady? She she doesn't sound right. W whatever. People are going to come up with all kinds of fantastical reasons to point fingers at somebody because that person wears a different color jacket 
than everybody else or they work different hours than everybody else or you know who knows whatever any number of excuse people are going to try to come up with and point fingers and say yep that's it that's our guy that, that's the one that's the phantom killer get him there was a young man who was a student at the university of arkansas in fayetteville arkansas which is in washington county who came from a very prominent texarkana family he actually killed himself in his room in his fayetteville dorm room in in at ua university of arkansas now he actually left a poem and a supposed confession to these killings as the phantom killer but investigators would actually determine that these were false this was a false confession that the young man was obviously going through whatever issues he had and and basically their leadings were that he was going to kill himself and then just wanted to have this one last little bit of fame and say yeah, I, I was the phantom killer i'm the one that did it before he killed himself but the investigators determined that this wasn't true he was not the phantom killer one suspect who was most often cited as the most probable killer was a repeat offender named Yoel Swinney or Swiney. Yoel? Yule? The first name is spelled Y O U E L L. The last name is S W I N N E Y. Yule or Yoel Swinney. Um, this individual had a record of car thefts, uh, counterfeiting, burglary, and various assault charges. So, again, a repeat offender with a lot of assault charges. Uh, Arkansas law enforcement official Max Tackett, that's a pretty cool name, had noticed that before each murder, there were reports of a car being stolen and then abandoned. So in July of 1946, a stakeout of a reported stolen car on the Arkansas side actually led the police to a woman who claimed to be Swinney's girlfriend. She actually provided details of the murders that had not been released to the public. So she was actually giving detailed accounts of murders that the public didn't know about, that, that, that the news weren't able to get a hold of. But later, her story changed, and she went on to marry Swinney. So, again, somebody just making it up. Her boyfriend, fiancé, soon-to-be husband, is a known criminal. Whatever reason, she's out here making up stories about these murders and claiming that he did it. Maybe she wanted the fame and, and everything to go with it for it. I don't know. It Again, it later came out that, that her what she was stating was false. Because of her unreliability, um, excuse me, because of her unreliable testimony and the fact that she could not be forced to appear as a witness against her husband, uh, law enforcement officials uh, decided to, to not prosecute against her or him for this so they just as far as for the murders they left it left it alone for him and for her making this stuff up they're just kind of like okay go away later in 1947 swinney he was jailed for life as a repeat offender for car theft but was released on appeal in 1973 he had done it so much so much that he was later arrested in 47 he was convicted he was given life in prison for car theft. That's, but again, like I said, he was released in 1973. A lot of sources do say that he died in prison, but a lot of sources say that he died in 1994 at a nursing home in Dallas. But the records do indicate that he, he was released in 1973. So I'm going to go with the latter, that he died later. That was one that came about. They claimed he was it, but apparently he wasn't. Years later, in 1977... An uh, Ar Arkinson is that how you say it? Arkinson? Charles B. Pierce, he actually produced an R-rated horror film called "The Town That Dreaded Sundown." This is that movie that I was talking about, with the tagline, "1977." That's 1976. I thought I said 1976 earlier. Hmm. Yeah, I'm looking at my notes. One one of my re uh, sources says 1976. One re source says 1977. I I'm gonna have to look it up and find. I'll look it up and find the exact year. But he's the one that produced this movie, uh, The Town That Dreaded Sundown. And the tagline was, quote, In 1946, this man killed five people. Today, he still lurks the streets of Texarkana, Arkansas. Um, it actually starred uh, Academy Award-winning actor Ben Johnson, 
Don Wells of Gilligan's Island. Pretty well known, right? Yeah, if you've ever seen Gilligan's Island. As well as Andrew Prime. Uh, Andrew Prime. Though it was purported to be based on these murders from the Texarkana Moonlight murders, um, a lot of people did dispute its accuracy. That, that's that's why I want to I see it. I want to watch it and see what they say in this movie. But again, everything I found about this movie does say that it was loosely based on this, but not 100%. Like, not like a true, true story of these murders, but just using it as inspiration probably, right? But again, like I said, it does remain uh, a cult classic. So with all of that, still to this day, like I said at the beginning of the episode, the identity of the Phantom Killer is still unknown to this day. It still remains unknown. They've never been able to identify an individual and say, yes, this is the person that did it. And once again, like I said at the beginning of the episode, this is still technically considered an open case. However, it is also considered a cold case, just being that there's no evidence or no new evidence to point at anybody that did it. But in 1996, the Texarkana Gazette published a 24-page special that they called The Phantom at 50. Because of this, the crime was revisited by local law enforcement, quite extensively actually, and they reinvestigated, looked into it, and they even revisited again later in 2003 uh, with the help of, through the uh, Dallas Morning News. But even after all that, more investigations, still nothing was found, nothing came of it, and it was still just considered a cold case, but technically not closed. It is still an open case. Who is the phantom killer? Who is the one that did it? So the two individuals at the beginning of all this in February 1946 that survived, Jimmy Paulus and Mary Jean Larry, after their incident, they did state that it was a man based on kind of the, the size and, and physical build of the person. So law enforcement had always been looking for a man. They did say that it was a man. So who was this man that attacked them? And was it the same man that murdered the other individuals? Maybe we'll never know. Um, perhaps there's new evidence that might come to life, or maybe they'll relook into it again in the future and be able to find and discover who it was that, that perpetrated these murders. But again, like I said, still to this day, it is unsolved, it is considered a cold case, but it is still an open case. So if you know anything about it, if you have any more information about it, if you have any comments about it, let me know, reach out to me. Um, I would love to hear it. I'd, I'd love to know your thoughts, your ideas, your opinions on it. Uh, hit me up on Facebook, Our Weird World. Email at ourweirdworldpodcast at gmail.com. That's going to be one of the best places to get in touch with me. Um, even on Instagram, I, I know I don't get on there as much as I probably should or would like to, but I do, uh, post some stuff on Instagram. Uh, also it's our weird world on there. Yeah. If you have any ideas, thoughts, questions, comments, concerns, gripes, whatever, let me know. I'd love to hear it. Reach out to me. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoy this episode and we'll catch you next time.